Hello there. Uh, just a couple of days before the budget, which happened earlier on today, the Institute for Prosperity published a paper called Manufacturing Unlocked, How to Make a Revival in Manufacturing a Reality. Well, that's obviously something very dear and close to all our hearts. The Institute for Prosperity was launched last year. It's the brainchild of the industrialist John Mills. And the board is made up of politicians of all parties. Uh, it's led by Caroline Flint, the former Labour minister. Another of the members is Sir Vince Cable, former business secretary in the coalition government and, of course, former leader of the Liberal Democratic Party. He joins me now. Sir Vince, a very warm welcome to you. What does this paper say? Uh, well, I think it originates with John Mills, who is an um, industrialist of some renown, who has been on a crusade for some years. I sort of encountered him in government when he was um, chasing me to be more proactive in uh, identifying and promoting the manufacturing sector. I, I didn't need much persuasion, but um, he seemed to be uh, doing something important. Uh, and since one of, I think, the, the better products of my years in government was relaunching industrial strategy, um, it seemed to me very important that some of those ideas were kept alive. I mean, the key premise is that, although this is now quite a small part of the UK economy, it's about 10%, um, though it's very difficult to quantify these things now, supply chains and are so um, interconnected and you get such an overlap of services and manufacturing. It is the bit of the economy that generates disproportionate amounts of exports, um, relatively high productivity, and is the source of a lot of the innovation. And if we're thinking about the UK progressing um, and raising living standards after a long hiatus since the financial crisis, then manufacturing has got to be a key part of it. Um, and John has put together some ideas. I mean, some are original, most are fairly familiar, but they're restated in a, in a, in a good, eloquent and updated way. I mean, the, the, obviously, they're, 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 as you say, they're, they're quite well, well-worn themes, uh, improving skills and training, um, uh, stimulating investment in capital machinery, plant and equipment and, and, and factory space and so on, long-term patient capital infrastructure. Th these are all issues, as, as you say, which have, uh, are, are very familiar. But for John Mills, there is a sort of guiding principle, which is that the exchange rate is massively um, uh, uh, disfavoring exports and manufacturing. And where it's currently around about 138.39 to the dollar, he believes it should be at parity. Now, I'm just wondering if, if this, A, is desirable for, uh, right across the economy. And is it ever going to happen? Is it possible? Well, this is, uh, this is an issue that provoked quite a lot of debate within the group. Um, uh, I, th I think in, in relation to historic trends, I mean, I think the, over the last five, indeed 10, maybe 20 years, it's been about 160. Um, so, you know, we're, we're actually, you know, th th there hasn't been too much appreciation that, that's damaging to manufacturing. But uh, in an ideal world, um, you know, if we could take advantage of um, foreign exchange markets, um, get to a more competitive rate, that would be an advantage. But it is very difficult because, uh, as you know, exchange rates are set by interest rate differentials. Uh, we don't have exchange controls. Uh, capital flows where it wants to flow. And we, 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 we can't go back to the world of the 1940s and 50s. It's just not realistic. Uh, but he does have some ideas about how... Uh, you could have intervention in the markets to get down to a more realistic rate. And certainly, I think it's a helpful argument to make that if we do find ourselves, as we found ourselves before the financial crisis in the so-called noughties with a rapidly appreciating rate, that one of the priorities of macroeconomic policy should be intervention to uh, keep the exchange rate down. Now, of course, that uh, it's tricky when you have an independent central bank uh, which sets interest rates and I'm, nobody's suggesting you, you change that. Um, but I, I, th I think it's an objective of policy. It's, uh, it's desirable, but I, as your question implies, I think there are serious question marks about feasibility.
Talking about the um, recommendations and the wish list, really, uh, that I, I just ran through a couple of minutes ago, everybody in manufacturing really understands that. And uh, uh, put two or three manufacturers in a room within 15 minutes, they're, they're automatically talking about skills gap and so on. I'm just wondering, and I'm going to use a, a strong word here, but it does seem to me that policymakers in Whitehall and Westminster seem frankly ignorant about what manufacturing is capable of as an engine driver of the economy. I mean, you were the last business secretary to make a major difference with the establishment of the, cap uh, the catapults, Innovate UK and so on. It's now hard to get policymakers interested in manufacturing, yet it's never been so vital. I mean, why is there this level of I'll use the word again, ignorance about manufacturing. Um, I'm not sure I totally accept. I mean, I, I think that we should have more awareness, but uh, I don't want to insult all my successors. Um, actually, most politicians love to be photographed in a factory surrounded by uh, uh, production lines and with a hard hat on, actually. It's a certain glamour associated with it. Uh, and although I'm not a fan of the present government, they, they have brought in a lot of people from... Um, you know, the regions of the Northeast and Yorkshire and Lancashire, the West Midlands, which have a manufacturing culture. And uh, they seem to be, you know, whether whether they're successful, I don't know, but they seem to be sincere in believing that a uh, manufacturing revival is desirable. It's the difference between general awareness, which I think there is, uh, and detailed knowledge, which there certainly isn't. I mean, there are very, very few... Uh, engineers and successful manufacturers in the House of Commons and in government. That's, that's uh, I think, a different level of knowledge. I, I, yes, I, I, I'll, I'll withdraw the word uh, ignorant and uh, I'll, I'll take your word awareness. Um, but having said that, I mean, the budget has just been announced. And I think that one thing really did stand out was the super deduction of 130 percent in year one of any uh, capital investment. An, an allowance that's going to run over the next two years. I, I can imagine that they, a lot of people in the manufacturing sector, their eyes popping out as they worked out just how uh, this might unleash uh, some investment, some much needed investment in machinery. Uh, I'm sure you would welcome it. Uh, very much so. No, I, I, I just wish the government that I'd been in uh, had done the same thing. In fact, we had uh, had arguments with George Osborne, but he was very fixated on this uh, lower rates of uh, corporation tax. I mean, I, I mean the whole. I mean, he must be spitting blood this afternoon after what's happened. But I think I think it is uh, absolutely correct. I mean, it, it's a good policy move that uh, the chancellor's made. It was the one really big thing in the budget that I I thought was. Um, was new and interesting and, and really very useful. I'm just going back to this issue of awareness of manufacturing. And I, I remember when I was speaking with Caroline Flint um, when the Institute for Prosperity was first launched. And as I said, there seems to be broad agreement on what needs to be done, but it's the politics that seems to be the, the, the bit where it, uh, you know, things fall or, or the message doesn't quite get through. Is that why the IFP perhaps stands a good chance of getting a decent hearing for some of these policy ideas? Um, because, as I say, I, I think it is a basically political issue at the moment. Yes, I, I, it's not so much getting a hearing. It's, it's about consistency. Um, I think what's, uh, th there is something in the British political culture, which I don't fully understand where it comes from, where every change of government and every change of minister has to lead to a whole set of wheels being reinvented. I mean, you saw this in the budget today. I mean, a lot of the ideas are just old stuff that's been rebadged. Um, the, every, you know, the regional growth fund has now come back as the leveling up fund and the accelerator scheme that I had in government has come back under a new name and the green investment banks come back as the infrastructure bank. I, I think the problem is lack of continuity and consistency. And I think a lot of this has to do with our very kind of tribal kind of politics. Um, you know, the big contrast with countries like Germany, which are much more consensus-based, and that's partly a product of their 
you know, political system and the you know, electoral reform um, is that they they do think in terms of decades uh, and that if they have a good system and it works as they do have with industrial training and the, um, in the innovation centers that they have and, and their system of funding business, uh, they keep it and they don't feel they need to constantly reinvent it and rebadge it. But, and, and what we're, we're lacking is any kind of long-term stability and consistency. I mean, a classic instance is apprenticeships, which have come and gone and had new names and new standards. I mean, we tried to set the system on a you know, reinvigorated path back in 2010, but within a few years, you've got the apprenticeship levy, which knocked everything sideways. Uh, and, um, you know, business understandably gets very frustrated that, that good initiatives tend not to last beyond a parliament. Yeah, if I can add the manufacturing advisory service to that, uh, to that list, that was cancelled in 2015. And that was, uh, that was a, a great loss to the sector and uh, hasn't been replaced. Um, I just wonder, and this is uh, perhaps going slightly into the realms of, uh, uh, not of fantasy, but speculation. I just wonder whether in this country, manufacturers, business generally, expects too much of government um, and maybe has over the decades come to rely on government only to find it doesn't quite get what it wants. I'm wondering if uh, politicians might turn around to manufacturers in this particular instance and say, get your own house in order, organise yourselves, organise your own training standards and everything else, um, and then present us with a model that works. Yes, I wouldn't be too hard on the business lobbies. I mean, actually, of the various groups I dealt with, the Engineering Employers Federation, which is the nearest thing to a manufacturing lobby. It's now Make UK, of course, yeah. Indeed, yeah. But but they were they were very effective and very well organised and lovely people, actually. They believed in what they were doing and were passionate advocates for it and, and actually quite effective lobbyists. I think that, you know, sadly, the problem is really one of scale. You know, if you have uh, a sector which is 10% of the economy and which is subdivided into uh, industries which are very, very different, um, that it's inevitable that there isn't that kind of critical mass for lobbying. I mean, the one bit of manufacturing which um, politicians do sort of sit up and take notice uh, for is, is the car industry. Um, because partly because they're big, uh, and partly because they they have very well, uh, very effective lobby groups. Um, when I was in government, you know, there were other bits of the sector that I tended not to hear very much from. I mean, the chemicals industry was, you know, the the, the CIA uh, was was a good operation, but they, they weren't voluble. Um, and the more complex bits, you know, heavy engineering, you tended not to hear anything at all from them. Uh, as quite apart from the, the, you know, the former, you know, now declining sectors like uh, ceramics, pottery, uh, they, they, you know, they didn't punch their weight, I felt. Uh, I, if I have a suggestion, actually, is that what the manufacturers should be doing is, is sort of teaming up with service sectors that they directly relate to. I mean, there's such now an interconnection between the information-based technologies and modern manufacturing and design and manufacturing that if they could somehow integrate their lobbying the creative industries with the manufacturers they they would they would really be listened to much more i think well that's a very very interesting uh, thought on which to uh, to to leave this so vince cable thank you very much indeed for being with us we really appreciate it uh, this has been a special report from Sanuk TV. I'm Nick Peters. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again soon.